and he's the director of the African Climate and Development Initiative at the University of Cape Town. Over the last 20 years or so, Mark has been at the forefront of climate change uh, research in several fields. His interests are in the detection of climate change trends, climate modeling and scenarios, assessment and uncertainty in climate projections and impacts, particularly with regard to water, food, and ecosystems and the resultant adaptations, uh, strategies, and implications of the failure of climate mitigation policies for climate impact and adaptation. So Mark's been deeply um, engaged with the whole game of climate change uh, for many years. Mark is a member of the South African Global, um, Global Change Science Committee and also the future Earth Africa Science Committee and editor of one of the journals in the field, the Journal of Environmental Research Letters. He's involved in a number of multinational research uh, projects that are aimed at understanding barriers and enablers uh, for effective and widespread adaptation to climate change in particularly semi-arid uh, reg um, regions of Africa and in Asia. And uh, he's looking at resource trade-offs and socio-economic development in the water to spray attachments. And as we know, the Western Cape is one of those. Um, Professor New has a BSc honors degree in geology from the University of Cape Town. He has a PhD in Geography from Cambridge University, and prior to joining the staff of UCT, he held the position of Professor of Climate Science at the University of Oxford. So it's my great pleasure to um, invite Mark to give his lecture, which is entitled Understanding Climate Change in Cape Town. Okay, thanks, Anton. If I talk like this, can you hear me at the back? Yeah, great. Okay, um, well, thanks for the opportunity to, for me and some of my colleagues to talk to you over the next um, five days. Um, I'm giving the first and the third, uh, first and the fourth talk in, in the series. Um, this one is really looking at the global scale issues around climate change. Um, but as you'll see from the, and as you probably know, seeing as you signed up for this course, we kind of zoom in uh, from global to local. So um, tomorrow, uh, my colleague Chris Jack from Environmental and Geographical Sciences will be talking about what the global forecast means for Cape Town. So what can we and can't we say about uh, what climate change hold, holds in store for Cape Town? Um, on Wednesday, um, and I'm afraid this is a switch in the original agenda, uh, because of a, a meeting that couldn't be avoided. Um, Helen Davies uh, from the city of Cape Town is going to be talking about, among other things, what keeps her awake at night as the person who's responsible for the city's response to climate change. She's also going to describe a little bit about what they've already done to hopefully make her sleep a bit better at night. Um, then on Thursday, I'll talk about uh, water security. Um, with a focus, well, at least towards the end of the lecture about uh, the current um, situation we're, we're sitting in, in Cape Town and in, in the southwestern Cape. And then finally on Friday, um, another colleague, Anna Taylor, um, is going to be talking about her analysis of um, how Cape Town has been responding to climate change. Um, and climate change is often considered a wicked problem. Um, competing views on uh, on, on, on the risks of it and what should be done, but in the Cape Town context also competing views and priorities uh, when you put uh, climate change against um, something like uh, affordable housing, for instance. So it's a really wicked decision problem about what you prioritize um, in a city decision-making context. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so today's talk, um, it's really sort of a climate change 101. Um, so for some of you, uh, some of this will be familiar. Um, for some of you, it may not be. But I want to go back to sort of first uh, physical principles about the Earth's energy balance and the natural greenhouse effect and how that works. Um, then talk about this term called radiative forcing, which is effectively greenhouse gas or global warming, but includes other features as well. And uh, talk about some of the uh, the natural and the human caused uh, changes or, or, or alterations of this energy balance. Then cover a really important issue um, which affects the extent of climate change that we might, be, um, might have in store for us, which are feedbacks within the climate system that amplify or dampen the direct human influence on climate. Then I'm going to 
get into talking about what we've seen happening to date, um, both in terms of the forcing of climate and in terms of the climate response. And then uh, talk a bit about the future. So how we go about forecasting or at least making projections of what climate change holds in store for us. And finally give some, uh, some sort of big picture um, sort of, uh, results around what we expect to happen globally um, and spatially at broad geographic scales in terms of that forecast that we make. And then obviously tomorrow, uh, Chris Jack will take all of that global sort of setting and talk about the implications for Cape Town. Finally, I want to sort of just give us a stock take on where we are in the international climate negotiation system in um, avoiding dangerous climate change. So uh, how, how well are we doing? And we can talk about um, the American election afterwards if you'd like to and what that means. Um, but um, this is a sort of a stock take on progress internationally, which isn't necessarily where all the action actually happens. Okay, so... Uh, Starting off, first year climatology for everybody. Um, the Earth's energy balance is really what controls the average temperature of the Earth. And all of, well, 99.9% .9 of that energy um, comes in from solar radiation, incoming shortwave solar radiation. So 342 watts per square meter is the, is, is the global average. Um, and a proportion of that is reflected back out into space before it reaches the surface of the Earth. A proportion is reflected at the surface um, and just bounces off and then goes back into space. And the reason it can go back into space and pass through the Earth's atmosphere is because the Earth is relatively what we call transparent to shortwave radiation. So the greenhouse gases, as we'll see just now, that uh, we're all worried about, don't really strongly affect incoming shortwave radiation. They affect the heat, the longwave radiation going out, out of the Earth. So, but in the end, about half of the incoming, just under half of the incoming radiation is absorbed by the surface of the Earth. Um, it differentially across the Earth, more absorbed uh, in the tropics than at, at the poles, but that's kind of the, glo the global average in terms of watts per square meter. What then happens is, if you, like when you're sunbathing, uh, if you absorb solar radiation, you warm up. Um, so the Earth then releases some of that warmth back into, into the atmosphere. And it happens through three mechanisms. The first are what we call thermals. So um, that is essentially heat moving up uh, through, if you like, convection. And uh, so it's actually warm air moving up. The second is through evapotranspiration. So when you evaporate water at the surface, it takes energy to turn the water from liquid to vapor. That energy becomes embedded in the water vapor and then is carried up um, as the water vapor flows away from the surface into the atmosphere. And that, um, this is sort of the situation if we didn't have a greenhouse gas effect. That's the other important thing to sort of note. Um, that surface, the, the, the thermals and the evapotranspiration are then, that heat is absorbed into the atmosphere um, through mixing or through condensation when the water vapor turns into drops and then rainfall, it releases heat. And then the atmosphere re-radiates or re-emits that heat um, upwards into space and without the greenhouse gas effect that would be about 97 watts per square meter. The other big loss of heat is through surface radiation and that's uh, the, the sort of Earth's equivalent of the shortwave radiation coming in from the sun. The Earth has a certain temperature and it gives off uh, electromagnetic radiation, this time in the long wave, in the infrared spectrum. And that, without the greenhouse effect, would go straight out into space. So what the greenhouse effect does is actually uh, absorb that outgoing long wave radiation. Um, and this is the real world now. There's 390 watts per square meters of radiation being emitted from the Earth's surface. Um, nearly all of that is absorbed in the atmosphere by greenhouse gases. And then it's emitted again um, as new radiation. And nearly all of it 
is re radiated back down towards the Earth. So essentially, you're recycling energy um, and, and, re and, and warming the surface of the Earth more with that backward long wave radiation. And that's what makes the Earth's average temperature 14 degrees centigrade above zero rather than, I can't remember the exact number, but an, a below zero freezing um, number. So it's that natural greenhouse gas effect that makes the Earth a habitable planet, essentially. So with that kind of recycling, then in the end, the, the atmospheric energy partitioning changes a bit as well, because some of that surface radiation that's going up and is absorbed is re-emitted straight up into space. And in the end, we have an outward flow of long-wave radiation of 235 watts per square meters, some of it from the atmosphere, some of it passing straight from the surface, and some of it re-emitted by clouds and greenhouse gases. And what, if you don't change the concentration of greenhouse gases, over time, the Earth comes to an equilibrium. And the energy coming in is shortwave radiation that isn't, that's absorbed at the surface, is matched by what's going out, plus what's absorbed, the shortwave radiation absorbed in the atmosphere. So, so everything stays in balance. So that's sort of the current picture. Um, what I want to do now is talk about how we can change that picture. So climate scientists talk about radiative forcing, of which greenhouse gas forcing is one type of radiative forcing. And radiative forcing is essentially anything that changes that energy balance that I've just talked about. So a number of ways that that could happen. We could change the amount of incoming solar radiation. So the sun has um, sunspot cycles. The amount of incoming solar radiation varies with those sunspot cycles and also varies on longer time scales. So if we think about 30 years ago, there was a slightly larger um, solar output, so we were getting more shortwave radiation coming in. Um, it seems like that on sort of 20 to 30 year cycles produces a variation in the Earth's surface temperature of somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2 degrees. We can also change what's reflected of the incoming solar radiation. So that's reflected by clouds, uh, these nasty things called aerosols, which are uh, pol very fine pollutants that are emitted along with greenhouse gases. Uh, so if you increase the amount of aerosols or, the, or, the, or the, the brightness of clouds change, then you will be reflecting more um, incoming solar radiation straight out into the atmosphere and having a cooling effect, a negative forcing of climate. We can change the reflectivity of the surface. Um, so if you go ahead and uh, remove the Amazon forest and turn it into pasture, you're going to re uh, increase the reflectivity of the land surface. So you'll be reflecting more uh, incoming radiation out and reducing the heating at the surface. And then, of course, we can change the concentration of greenhouse gases. So we can take those natural levels of greenhouse gases, the carbon dioxide, et cetera, that were in, are naturally occurring in the atmosphere, burn fossil fuels, and increase the concentrations. And that increases the sort of strength of this recycling, this internal recycling of heat, absorption, feeding it back to the surface, heating up the surface, and that sort of endless loop there until it reaches equilibrium again. The other really important aspect of the climate system to understand is this idea of feedbacks. And these are internal responses that amplify or dampen an initial response. So some, some of you who work in engineering or other areas will understand this idea of feedbacks and feedback loops. In terms of the climate system, a feedback is really the response, a response related to the warming that we experience. So if we increase greenhouse gases or decrease them, the temperature goes up or goes down, so you have a warming or a, a cooling. That change is either you know, an increase in, in, uh, in temperature or a decrease, and that produces some change in the Earth system um, that then has a positive or negative amplifying effect. So positive feedback, in our sense, adds extra warming. It's, it's a change in some other aspect 
of the Earth system that produces an, an additional warming, and negative feedback does the opposite. And then that uh, feeds through to speed up warming, and in theory, you end up in a cycle of continual feedbacks that warm and warm and warm, or cool and cool and cool. And one of the classic examples of that from deep history in Earth is the snowball Earth um, uh, sort of occurrence, where actually in a number of times in the past, it seems like virtually the whole of the Earth was glaciated and covered in ice and snow. And you have to reach a critical amount of uh, ice and snow cover, which reflects incoming solar radiation. You get a runaway glaciation of, of the Earth. So some of the important climate feedbacks um, when we're talking about contemporary climate change. The first is that snow and ice feedback uh, loop. So this is a, a satellite picture of, of sea ice in the Arctic. And effectively what you have here is, if you can see where there is no ice, you've got nice deep blue ocean with low reflectivity and shiny white ice with high reflectivity. So if you heat up the Arctic, reduce the extent of sea ice, less sun, incoming sunlight will be reflected, more will be absorbed, and you'll add to the warming. Another really interesting one is clouds, because they can be both positive and negative feedbacks. So clouds are uh, nice, bright, shiny things when viewed from the top, and they reflect a lot of incoming solar radiation. But they're also full of water vapor, and water vapor is actually a very, very strong greenhouse gas itself. So changes in the nature of clouds, depending on where the clouds are and what their structure is, can lead to either a net warming or a net cooling, depending on whether the greenhouse effect dominates or the reflective effect dominates. And our best estimate to, to date is that it's, they're, they're a positive effect, um, but it's one of the sort of the holy grails of, of climate research is to really try and pin that down in a lot more, uh, with a lot more certainty. I mentioned water vapor. Um, that actually isn't water vapor, because you can't see water vapor. That's water vapor condensing to form mist, but it's the closest I could get to showing you, what, showing you water vapor. But anyway, um, water vapor itself, as I said, is a very powerful greenhouse gas. And the feedback loop there is that in a warmer world, you tend to get more evaporation, and the water holding capacity of the atmosphere increases. So warming up uh, increases evaporation, you get more water vapor stored in the atmosphere, and so you get a, a positive greenhouse effect occurring. And then the final <clears throat> feedback I wanted to talk about was carbon dioxide itself. And this is a, that, that graph over there shows um, our estimates of global, uh, well, uh, in fact, of local temperature over Antarctica in blue over 100,000 year timescales. Um, from 425,000 years ago in the past to, to the present. And then the, the little red dots are the measurements of carbon dioxide trapped in little air bubbles in the ice. So people drill a core down through two or 3,000 meters of ice. You can pick out the individual layers, which is each year of snowfall, and you can measure both uh, the oxygen isotope levels, which tell you about temperature, and the carbon dioxide levels that are trapped in there. And what you can see, if you look quite carefully, is that as temperature goes up and down, so the carbon dioxide goes up and down. And what you actually have happening there is a feedback. So as the Earth warms up, the, Earth, the, the oceans and the land surface release carbon, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And as the Earth cools, they tend to draw down carbon. So one of the ways that can happen is that the amount of carbon dioxide that can be dissolved in seawater actually increases as the temperature drops. So at the surface of the ocean, the, as, as temperature drops, the what we call the partial pressure or the, the concentration of carbon dioxide in that surface water um, actually increases. So that's a, what we call a positive feedback loop. And then if you look at in detail at these records and the timing of temperature versus carbon dioxide, you can actually see there's a lag in the system. So temperature starts changing first, then carbon dioxide follows. So that tells us that it's a, a feedback of carbon dioxide to temperature driven by the glacial periods, which are primarily driven by changes in the sun's orbit rather than the other way around. So these are four really important feedbacks, probably all positive, that then 
add to amplify the global change in temperature with a given change in radiative forcing, whether it's greenhouse gases or changes in solar radiation. Okay, so what I want to move on to now is talking about what we've seen happening historically um, and start off by looking at the emissions and then the resultant concentrations that we, that we see in the atmosphere. So this is our best estimate of historic emissions of carbon dioxide, um, one of the critical greenhouse gases, the most important, there are others, but if you looked at another gas, it would follow exactly the same trend. And it comes, those historic emissions or additions into the atmosphere um, come from two main sources, uh, forestry and land use change, primarily conversion of, if you like, of pristine um, land into agricultural land. And that's been chugging along at roughly a similar level for the last um, several uh, tens of decades. Then the other big, uh, the, the one we all know about obviously is, is the gray curve there, which are the emissions of, from fossil fuels, cement production, which is often people don't know about, but a really um, sort of the, the urbanization and construction of, of this human world has actually contributed an enormous amount of, of greenhouse gases just through producing cement. Um, so that's where we are. We're currently sort of emitting somewhere between uh, 35 and 40 uh, gigatons. Uh, that's a, what's it, a thousand million tons of, of carbon dioxide a year and, and proportionate amounts of all of the other um, greenhouse gases as well. Now, what we then see happening at the same time is obviously an increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide in in green, uh, methane and, and, and N2O, the other two other important greenhouse gases. Um, we see those trends over the same period. The dots are actually from ice cores, measurements from ice cores, and the solid lines are real uh, measurements uh, in sort of from the instrumental, instrumental age. And what we're seeing here is essentially a residual of what isn't absorbed in the oceans and the land surface. So currently, Somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of carbon dioxide that's emitted doesn't remain in the atmosphere. It gets taken up through photosynthesis in plants and then stored either in live plants or uh, in dead uh, plant material which falls into the soil and slowly decomposes and is released as CO2 again. And then in the oceans, the carbon dioxide is absorbed at the surface of the ocean, used by uh, oceanic plants, so plankton essentially to grow and becomes part of the food chain and a lot of it then when the eventual uh, biggest, uh, what would be the word, predator in the chain dies, um, it, it then sinks down and into the deep ocean is taken out of circulation for timescales that we're interested in at the moment, order of hundreds to thousands of years. So that we call the biological pump in the ocean, it's actually a biological so it's a chemical biological process that actually draws that CO2 out. So anyway, we see these, these trends occurring. Um, and the, uh, the interesting thing is that we, we know from uh, the characteristics of the carbon, for instance, that this has to come from, the, the CO2 has to come from fossil fuels. Because the, um, the, the ratio or what we call the isotope ratio, heavy to light atoms of carbon in coal and oil is different to that of modern carbon. And so we see a change in that uh, isotope ratio in the average levels in the atmosphere, which tells us that that carbon is coming from old carbon sources, fossil fuel sources. So if we take all of that accumulated sort of uh, increase in um, in greenhouse gas emissions and other emissions into consideration, we can actually look and see what the perturbation of the energy balance actually has been. And this is sort of a summary across carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, saying where each of them contribute almost equally about one and a half watts per square meter of changed energy balance over the, relative to pre-industrial levels. So if you look today, compared to 150 years ago, we've seen this shift. These aerosols, which get emitted 
with the carbon dioxide and other uh, products of fossil fuel burning are the ones that reflect incoming solar radiation. And their net effect is a cooling effect, but relatively small compared to the CO2. And then land use, um, historically compared to 1850, again, a slight increase in the reflectivity of the land surface, so reflecting more of the incoming solar radiation. And just for comparison, I wanted to show you what the change in the forcing due to the sun is compared to pre-industrial levels. It's about 0.05 watts per square meter. So it goes, it, it changes a bit, but relative to these other perturbations of the energy balance, it's, it's, it's really not a big player at all. So now we need to ask, okay, we've changed the energy balance. The earth is storing, or, or more heat is being trapped into, in, into the atmosphere initially through greenhouse gas uh, uh, forcing. Um, so where does that heat go? And this is a really interesting um, graph. I'll move across here and point it out. But this shows, um, at least for the period that we've got measurements of the last 40 years or so, where that extra heat has been going. And the two blue curves show the accumulation of heat in the oceans, the upper and the lower oceans. And literally, sort of 95% of all of that heat, due to the atmospheric effect, is being absorbed by the oceans eventually. So the atmosphere warms, the, the, um, the ocean then draws heat from the atmosphere, and that heat is stored in the ocean, both the shallow and, and the deep ocean. Some of it's gone to uh, melting ice. So some of it's gone into uh, warming up the land surface, and a very small fraction actually gone into heating the residual is effectively the heat from the greenhouse effect that isn't taken up by other parts that, that goes into the atmosphere. So when we talk about global temperature change, we measure you know, surface air temperature at two meters. What we're actually measuring is about 2% of the total change in energy due to greenhouse gases. The big elephant in the room is that ocean that's storing that heat and acting as a almost like a capacitor for, for, for global warming at the moment. But that, that heat buildup in the ocean has obviously longer term in implications. Okay, so that's the heating of the Earth. What do we see happening in terms of uh, the actual observed climate? And again, I'm really focusing at the large global scale here. Um, these graphs show uh, measurements of the uh, change in, in climate, in, 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 diff in different climate phenomena. So the left-hand panel at the top is the land surface air temperature. We see that uh, well-known positive trend, particularly since about the middle of the last century. Um, the middle one is sea surface temperature, so that's actually the measure, the temperature of the water um, of, of the surface ocean. And the bottom one is the marine air temperature, the equivalent of land air temperature, sort of two meters or so above the surface of the ocean as measured by ships. And all of those show that increasing trend. We, look at, we can look at upper air temperature, the tropospheric temperature, which is in the upper atmosphere, increasing ocean heat content, increasing, and specific humidity. That's the amount of water per cubic meter that the atmosphere is holding. So that water vapor effect, you can see it happening there because the specific humidity of the atmosphere is also increasing. If we start looking at um, slightly less direct uh, effects, the top left shows the increase in sea level rise, approximately 20 centimeters since measurements started in 1900. The decrease in summer Arctic sea ice extent, the other long graph, decreasing um, the top right um, snow cover over the northern continental areas. So as things warm up, you get less of the precipitation falling as snow in the first place, and then it melting faster. So, you, so the snow season is, uh, if you like, less spatially extensive, but also shorter. And then the final one is what we call glacier mass balance. That's essentially the amount of ice that's stored in mountain glaciers around the world, not the big ice sheets. And that also shows this decreasing trend. So when we look at sort of different uh, measures of the state of the Earth system or the climate system, they're all showing the kind of response that we would expect from adding energy 
in Tür. Okay, well, I take a sip of water, I lose my voice. Um, so that's sort of what's happened um, and how it we, we think is strongly consistent with what, how we understand the climate system operates. So it's, we, we think that it's um, consistent with our theoretical understanding of the climate system. Obviously, the big question is what does the future hold? And so the second half of this talk, I'm really going to move on to forecasting the future. So to forecast what the climate is going to do, we really need to do two things. We need to forecast what the forcing of the climate is going to do. So what a greenhouse gas is going to do. Um, do we expect solar radiation to do anything strange? And what are pollutants like aerosols going to do? How is land cover going to change in the future? And then given that, some estimate or forecast of the forcing, then we need to forecast the climate system response. So future radiative forcing feeds into then saying, well, what does that mean from a climate perspective? And here's a, I don't want to go into detail, but that shows the complexity of the climate system. When we're trying to understand and forecast that response, there's a whole lot of different interconnected aspects of the Earth system that we need to take into account to understand what the integrated climate response actually is. So, from a climate change perspective today, the big question is what are future emissions of greenhouse gases and other pollutants going to, going to do? And unfortunately, that's almost harder than forecasting the response of the climate system because it involves people, um, not just natural science. And as there's a whole lot of interconnected factors that, that would affect that. So, in the very basic sense, we need to understand what causes emissions. So one of the primary drivers of that is population. So we've seen a world population that's you know, increased many times over the last 100 years and is going to project to increase in the future. So we're currently at roughly 7 billion. The best estimate of the UN and, other, and the EU, for instance, is a peak in population of about 9 million. Um, roughly at the middle of the century, but it depends on assumptions about rates of fertility. So if um, rates of fertility, for instance, in Africa, stay higher than the best estimate, then that population goes, estimate goes up. If fertility rates drop, then maybe we'll be uh, somewhere between seven, a peak at seven and nine uh, million, sorry, billion people. So that's almost like an underlying driver then of emissions. The next step is, you know, what do those people do? Um, and primarily, it's what do they consume? So, uh, and what do they consume in terms of transport? Um, or what, what transport do they use? How do they get around? What do they consume in terms of uh, goods and services? And what do they consume in, in terms of food? Um, so, you can imagine a very rich world where everybody consumes a lot. So, everybody has three TVs and has pizza for supper every night versus a world that looks like, uh, I don't know, somewhere like northern Namibia, where people at the moment don't, can't even put food on their table. The food consumption varies depending on your economic status. What we'd hope is that we kind of all are able to have pizza, um, but that's, that's kind of that's the reality. But then the critical side in terms of um, understanding the emissions is first the energy that goes into that consumption or that supports that consumption, and secondly, the type of energy. So if you think about transport, uh, you can either use uh, petrol or you can use batteries. Um, in terms of electricity, you can either use renewable or you can use fossil fuel. You could use nuclear, you could use oil. So the energy choices that are made in terms of your source of energy are really sort of coupled with the level of consumption really control what future emissions are going to do. Um, linked to that would be then the efficiency of energy use. So even with a given mix of energy sources, which might be 50% coal, 50% clean, um, if you're really efficient, 
you could be using half as much energy for the same consumption, for instance, as if you were inefficient. So there's an efficiency uh, question mixed in there. And then something that isn't really talked about a lot, but there are a lot of emissions associated with food production. So the type of food that we consume, whether it's livestock dominated or grain and, uh, and, and vegetable oriented really has strong implications for the embedded carbon that's in that food that we consume. So all of these things come together to make it pretty damn difficult to say exactly what future emissions are going to do, but we can come up with scenarios based on which end of the spectrum we think things like uh, GDP or, or uh, e economic wealth, consumption, and the energy embedded in that consumption actually change. And you can come up with, with ranges of what might happen. Yeah. Um, what about like clothing? Sorry? I honestly don't know, but everything that you consume or wear has a some kind of carbon footprint to it. So if, if you recycle your clothing or don't buy new clothes, you would be have a lower carbon footprint. Yeah. So <clears throat> where was I? <laughs> so what uh, the climate sort of science and impact world has done is said, yeah, we recognize all of that. Uh, sorry, I need to say, no, that's fine. I'll, I'll talk about it now. Um, we, we can't f forecast the future, but we can say what we think are the, the range of things that could happen, a set of plausible possible futures, and then we can evaluate what that means in terms of the climate system response. So what we have coming through um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, process is a set of um, emission scenarios of uh, future emissions that could happen under a set of economic and policy assumptions. And they vary from that one at the top, which is the gray line called message 8.5, which is essentially just a rapid increase, continued increase in carbon dioxide because of a, a rapidly um, economically developing world that remains wedded to um, high carbon energy, essentially. And then at the bottom here, this green one, we have a, this 2.6 scenario, um, which effectively says, well, emissions peak pretty much yesterday, and they start declining very rapidly. Um, and so that's sort of the one where everybody gets their act together on a policy front, get all the right instruments into place to shift consumption and energy in the right direction, and we end up with that kind of trajectory. And then anything in between and possibly beyond is also possible. But what we have here that's chosen through sort of a process of negotiation and trying to catch the spread are a set of four different emission scenarios. Um, and each of those numbers there uh, represents a, a radiative forcing number. So remember I talked about perturbations in the radiation balance in terms of watts per square meter. The 8.5 is a perturbation of 8.5 watts per square meter on average globally by 2100. And this one is a 2.6 watts per square meter. So those are the emissions. They then translate into a set of concentrations. And the interesting thing to note here is that even with this quite radical reduction in emissions, it takes a long time for that concentration curve to start decreasing. Because we've got a historic accumulation of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's like trying to turn a, a, a super tanker. You have to, you know, it takes a long time to turn it back and get it going in the opposite direction. So, that, so, so this is why in the sort of global policy world, there's this call for really steep emission reductions now if we're going to achieve anything um, that has impact in terms of uh, reducing concentrations. So we have this set of possibilities. We could pick other ones as well. Yeah. Sorry, at 1,370 CO2, yeah. what does the world look like? We'll see now. Okay. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> warmer than the other one. <laughs> but you could have worked that out, I'm sure. <clears throat> okay, so, so the, the sort of the, the climate scientists then draw off that work that's done by the, what we might like to call energy modelers, they're essentially uh, social economists who have 
very fancy models for estimating those kind of things. And they need to use models as well, simulation models, to estimate what the response of the climate system is to that change in radiative forcing. Don't want to go into detail, but climate models essentially try to find the balance between computational intensity and a level of detail that gives us our best bet at simulating the climate response. So a climate model is a computer model, a bit like a weather forecast model. I mean, how many of you use, um, what's it, yr.no, or one of those for your, okay. So it kind of does a pretty good job. You know whether to take an umbrella or not um, tomorrow, for instance. But climate models are, have evolved out of those weather forecast models, but have had to have added in the important parts of the climate system that play out on longer term timescales. So like sea ice, or like the ocean, like the carbon cycle, et cetera. So they're sort of weather forecast models with add-ins so that you can run them over long times to look at this integrated response. And they basically, as with most computer models, that it, they break up the Earth into small little computational bits, and, and then it all works together in a very clever way that I don't understand, um, because I'm not a computer scientist, but basically tries to simulate the response of the atmosphere and the ocean and the ice and the land surface in an integrated way um, as we change the, the rate of forcing. So those climate models uh, have been developed and are continually evolving, and there are about 30 or 40 centers, research centers around the world that run these climate models to try and see what the, the response might be. So what one would then do is take one of those em emission scenarios of carbon dioxide plus all the other important radiative forcings of climate, feed it into a climate model, and run that out for 50, 100, 200 years to see what the climate model thinks the climate response will be. So to get on to what they tell us, here are um, sort of the latest results as of the last assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We run from 1850 through to 2300, um, and each of those dark colored lines is the average across multiple models of the global temperature response to one of those scenarios, those emission scenarios. So the pink one is your 8.5 that you're asking about. So by the end of the century, a warming compared to pre-industrial levels of somewhere around about four degrees globally. Um, if one takes that scenario out into the future, it kind of, the emissions flatten out roughly in 2200. So you, so you continue to warm and then slowly as emissions flatten and concentration stabilize, you end up with a sort of a stable temperature of eight degrees um, warmer. But that's kind of, that is a real extreme kind of case. This is the, um, the one we should really be interested in, which is the, um, the 2.6, which is really about a mitigation uh, emissions reduction scenario. And that sort of peaks us somewhere at around about, um, so this is present day, so yeah, about um, an a best estimate of 0.5 over the present day, so somewhere below um, two degrees over pre-industrial levels, about 1.5 degrees. But you did see what is required to get there in terms of emissions reductions. The spread is the spread of responses across all of those climate model runs that use exactly the same input. So what we're saying here is these models um, are imperfect. We know they're imperfect. They're simplifications of the real system. They're even things about the real system we don't really uh, have, a, have a good grip on, like the cloud feedback effect. So by running multiple models that have done their best to represent the system, the spread tells us something about the uncertainty in our ability to estimate that response. And that spread gets larger the faster the warming, because essentially you're taking the climate models out of where they're comfortable. It's like the, the danger of extrapolation. When you're doing a statistical analysis, you can estimate within your data. When you go outside of your data, then your uncertainty increases. So here we're pushing the climate system into rates of warming, where then the models internal responses start to diverge from each other because they're all behaving differently. So what does that mean in terms of patterns of change? Um, what we have here are a couple of examples. The left-hand column is in the near future. So it's the average 
of around the 2020s or so. So um, in terms of the temperature change around the globe relative to um, roughly the turn of the century. And here we have in the far future, the end of the century, under two different, those two different extreme emission scenarios. The top one, the one that pushes us to a four degree warming, and this one, the one that takes us to a, a sort of one and a half degree global warming. And what sort of the immediate thing to notice is that those spatial patterns vary quite a lot. So f four degrees global warming, the top right, means very different things in terms of the temperature change experienced in different geographic locations. The oceans tend to warm less fast than the continents, and the continental areas, and particularly the dry areas, if you look at the core of southern Africa, tend to warm up more. And then the high latitudes also warm up faster because of that snow and ice feedback effect. You're melting more snow, so you get more local, local warming. So for South Africa, um, for instance, a global warming of two degrees means a local warming of somewhere between three and four degrees. Um, and that's the same for many parts of, of Africa. So it's always good to bear in mind when people talk about global targets that mean something very different at the local scale. The other sort of picture, big picture I wanted to show you was in terms of rainfall or precipitation changes. This, this is the end of the century, so not the near-term stuff, and again under a, a low emissions and a high emissions future. Um, and if you look at the colors, everywhere that's blue is for mean annual rainfall or, or so total rainfall to increase, and everywhere that's um, yellow or orange is for a decrease. And the, so obviously, as with the right, with the right hand, uh, map, we've got a much more extreme warming, so the patterns of change we see are much more extreme. But there's a consistency across here that is very, very interesting. And that is that the high latitudes in the tropics get wetter, and the, mid, the, the subtropics get drier. And if we look at what that, how that compares to the current patterns of rainfall, essentially the current areas that are already dry and water stressed become drier, and the areas that already have quite a lot of rainfall, like the mid-latitudes in the tropics, as a general picture, get wetter. So existing patterns of rainfall essentially get exacerbated um, un under a global warming scenario. OK, so just to finish off, um, I thought we should have a quick look at progress in terms of um, meeting international targets. This, is a, uh, this diagram is, is really just a cartoon to illustrate um, why we might, why, why uh, sort of the best available science suggests we should be avoiding the most extreme levels of, of global warming. And it really is almost like a, a traffic light system. So as you go from white through yellow to purple, it's saying the impacts of a given amount of warming, um, this is present day, over present day here and on that side over pre-industrial levels, the impact becomes greater and greater. Um, so uh, we don't need to talk about the details, but uh, ecosystem threats, the, effect, the effects of extreme weather events, uh, the general impacts of, of, of climate change on food and agriculture, etc. these all sort of contribute to this. So where are we today? We're about 0.9 degrees over pre-industrial levels. So we're currently sitting about here in the yellow or orange zone. So it's kind of the warning signs. If you see an orange traffic light, you either stop or you jump the lights and risk a fine. So we can think of that kind of analogy. Um, as we then get, what we then have are two, out of, the, out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement at the end of 2015, two targets, sort of policy targets came out. The first was a two degree target to stay below two degrees. That's kind of a hard ceiling from a policy ambition point of view, and you can see why. Because if you think of this just in terms of your traffic light system, in many of these dimensions, you're in the red zone now. You've shifted from, from orange to red, so you want to be out of, out of the danger zone. And then within the Paris Agreement, there was an ambition to stay below one and a half degrees, primarily driven by some of the most vulnerable nations, uh, sort of the, the, the low-lying Pacific Island states, for instance, where 1.5 degree actually means losing your homeland to sea level rise. So that's sitting around about there. 
So when we think about progress in terms of uh, action on climate change, we need to be thinking of them in terms of these two targets. Um, sort of what we think is the, the, the worst that aggregately across the world we can deal with and what would actually be very nice to have because it uh, reduces the impacts on those who are most vulnerable and actually least, um, least responsible for the climate change we see. So <clears throat> this is a, a very nice graph and I, if anybody's really interested in this kind of stuff I would really make a note of that uh, website Climate Action Tracker. It basically keeps you up to date with everything that's being pledged by different countries around the world in terms of emissions reduction and says, okay, what does that mean for global climate change? So what they do is they kind of analyze, um, you know, what each country is promising in terms of their action on climate change. They, they run it against a baseline, and the, base, the baseline is basically a set of estimates about climate uh, emissions in the absence of climate policy. And that ranges, produces a global temperature of between about 4.4 and 5 degrees by the end of the century. So that's kind of no action. That's the baseline case. Then they analyze um, what they call current policy projections. So that's what's actually already happening. So let me give an example. The UK government has legislated that it will reduce emissions by a certain amount. That's a policy that's actually happened. So that. So if you, look, if, they look, if you look across all countries at the policies that have actually been implemented, then you end up with a global temperature change of about 3.5 to 3.9 degrees, if they happen. So for instance, if we really did get a Donald Trump in the UK and he changed his, and he, he changed his mind about that legislation and withdrew the legislation, then you'd, that would fall out of that policy framing again. Then there's what they call pledges. Um, and this is in the, in the lead up to the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, every country had to pledge what their emissions reduction targets were. So these are not things that they've actually put in place, it's what they've promised to do. And the current set of pledges, when averaged up around the world, take us to about 2.5 to 2.8 degrees. And that red band there shows roughly what emissions uh, would be doing in terms of peaking and then slowly declining according to those current set of pledges. The bottom two are what's actually needed in terms of emissions trajectories globally to reach that two degree, to stay safely below that two degree and the 1.5 degree target. So effectively, this is the gap. Um, that's the gap in terms of emissions between what's currently uh, going to happen and this is between what's promised and what's going to happen. So there's still a lot of action, if you like. So if we take how's the world doing, um, the pledges are moving us in the right direction, but they really only got us halfway up the hill or down the hill, if you like. And that really ends up with this very cool thermometer that they always have on the front page of their website, which shows the current policies, giving us a best estimate of a global warming of 3.6 with a range, 95% confidence range of 2 to 4.9. And then the pledges, if you add them in, a best estimate of 2.8 degrees um, and th with a range of 2.3 to 3.5. So <clears throat> current sort of, if you speak quietly to any climate scientist or any energy modeler, they would say the chances of staying below two degrees are pretty much out the window um, just because of inertia in the global system. Um, if you remember that green curve where we had to s start decreasing emissions today, almost, that's just not going to happen. So the real question is how rapid ac action can be to keep us as, as close to that two degree target uh, as possible. So that's uh, the end of my talk. Um, tomorrow, Chris Jack is going to take what I've uh, sort of spoken about and then interpret it in terms of what we can say with and, and with what confidence about what that global forecast actually means for for the city of Cape Town. So thanks very much, and I'm happy to take some questions. <laughs> you did have your question earlier, so, <laughs> yeah. What is the effect of sea levels on those scenarios? In what sense? So, in terms of the heart, the, the warming of the thing, and how it's going to affect the land mass, which is a very big thing there. That you would what would the scenario be there? Because you're going to flood the 
Ja. Ja. So sea level rise is sort of one of the big impacts that we're almost certain we're going to get because, um, because of that energy that's being absorbed. If you look at the sort of best estimates, I'm trying to think from the top of my head, but we're talking end of century, somewhere between 25 and one centimeters and one meter of sea level rise, depending on which scenario we use and depending especially on, on the stability of the Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, longer term, if we reach critical thresholds about the stability of the Greenland ice sheet, then we're talking, I can't remember, I think it's six meters of sea level rise. But that plays out over hundreds, probably, you know, so you might get two meters by the end of uh, 2200, four meters by the end of 2400 or something like that. So, and then a lot depends on, the, on your sort of coastal topography. So, because um, it's really the, 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 the low-lying, flat coastal areas where you know, a 20 centimeter rise in sea level can produce in an unprotected system um, 200 to two kilometers of, of coastal retreat, for instance. So then a lot depends on the decisions that are made around protection and management of that coastal area. So long term, um, you really want to be buying your your grandchildren's holiday house about 300 meters away from the shore, basically. <laughs> yeah. Could you say something to us about the people who are either the deniers of uh, climate change or the question of how serious it is? What, because we hear a lot of people who are not worried about this problem. Mm. So I think there are very few. Sorry. Yeah. So it was a, just a comment on uh, the, the deniers of climate change, and I think there was a sort of one is that those who are, like totally disbelieve in the phenomenon, and the second is those who argue that it is happening, but we don't need to worry about the potential impacts. Um, so <clears throat> there are very few people in the what we would call the skeptics part of the, of. of of the spectrum who deny that greenhouse gases are being emitted and that it has a, a warming effect. They would argue strongly about the amount of warming and that a lot of what we've seen is uh, due to other causes. But they, I mean, the, the, it's really the far, it's a real extreme as you say that, that, that that's not, not a problem. But that then feeds through into influencing, um, if you like, <coughs> the Donald Trumps of this world, who will pick the denier's statement that suits their own political and psychological uh, needs. So even if there's only one out of a thousand, uh, so one out of a hundred deniers who says climate change isn't happening, Donald Trump will pink, pick that one as his evidence source. So, so there's a real you know, propagation of impact into public consciousness. I'll follow up in a second. Um, in terms of impact, um, I think that is where a lot of the debate is happening. So there's a, you know, a, ne a neoliberal economist would basically value all the lives around the world. Um, a life in Rwanda would be worth uh, one thousandth of a life in the USA, and they would say actually the economically rational thing to do is not to mitigate but to deal with the, the impacts because uh, the, the value per life uh, changes. So that's kind of the, the extreme neoliberal approach to that. Um, and then within that, there's a whole spread of questions around where's the, <clears throat> how much adaptation do you have to do versus mitigation? Because there's always a cost benefit analysis. And the argument is around, I guess, the details of that. So, so, um, and I think a lot of that is often influenced by where you're sitting in the world um, and your ability to actually uh, cope and, and adapt and the resources you have to adapt. Yeah. And at the moment, a lot of that noise is coming from <coughs> people who are better off and are better able to, to respond. Yeah. So you, you uh, one there and then. Um, um, I, I just come back from filming the climate change conference in America, mm -hmm. and um, the, they said that the average temperature of the world last year was 1.2 degrees above <laughs> no, 
was my thumb suck. Um, but what when, when we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when when we look, when we talk about this, um, so yes, last year was a particularly warm year. But what, when we talk, we want to smooth out the year-to-year -year variations. 